Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in a previous lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we looked at the tone controls that live inside electric guitars. In this lecture, we'll take a look at the tone controls that live inside your amplifier, particularly a kind of tone control setup called the FNV Tone Stack, where FNV stands for Fender Marshall Vox. There's different variations of this, and a lot of companies besides Fender, Marshall, and Vox have used this configuration. But I should mention there are a lot of other tone control schemes. Now, you can build active filters using vacuum tubes. Pete Millette has this really cool website where he shows how to construct some solid key filters using vacuum tubes. However, every guitar amp I've seen uses passive tone controls. I'm not including presence controls in the discussion in terms of tone controls because the presence control is a deeply complicated thing that I'll deal with in another lecture. Restricting our choices to passive components means that the poles of the transfer function have to lie along the real axis. You can't have complex conjugate poles or complex conjugate zeros. This limits how spiky you can make your response in the frequency domain. Now, just because everybody else sticks to passive tone controls doesn't mean you have to in your own designs. I think tube-based active tone controls for guitar amps is a wide open avenue for a future exploration. Now, tone controls don't have to be fancy. Here's an instance of the Vox AC4 amplifier. Over on the left, we have the preamp, and on the right, we have the power amp. Both of these are using pentodes, which is a little strange. Pentodes are common in power output stages, but they're not very common in preamp stages. I'll talk about pentodes in a future lecture. Anyway, what they have sandwiched between them looks very much like a standard tone control and volume pot configuration that you would have in an electric guitar. Of course, for the purposes of this lecture, we want to look at more intricate things. So let's take a look at the Fender Bassman actually one particular Fender Bassman, the model 5F6-A. And you can think of this as the progenitor of all modern high power guitar amplifiers. You can tell this is a pretty early Fender design because of the use of a tube rectifier in the power supply. And we do have the power supply down here. We have the main power amp stage over here. We have the phase inverter that consists of a long-tailed pair here. Zooming in a bit, we see that there's actually three preamp stages, although in general you only use two of them in series. So you can plug into the bright channel, that includes this common cathode stage and then this common cathode stage. Or you can plug into the normal channel, which has a separate common cathode stage that then goes to the second common cathode stage. And you can actually plug two different instruments into these two channels and it will mix the results. And another thing musicians would do is actually strap the inputs together to put your signal into both the bright and the normal inputs at the same time. So although it vaguely looks like a long-tailed pair, it is not a long-tailed pair. That's not what it's doing here. These two common cathode amplifiers happen to share a cathode resistor down here that plays a role in the grid to cathode voltage biasing. But notice that it's completely bypassed. So as a result, there's not really any coupling between the signals of these two amplifiers. So it's not a long-tailed pair. So here we have two load resistors of 100K and those go up to this 325 volt upper rail supply. And the outputs of these two amplifiers are mixed according to these volume controls and presented to this second stage, that's a common cathode amplifier, and that's DC coupled to this cathode follower. So this cathode follower can present a low output impedance to our tone stack and then the tone stack presents its signal to the input of the long-tailed pair. Notice, incidentally, that the only real difference between the normal and bright channels is this trouble bleed capacitor on the volume control for the bright channel. So let's take a look at this tone stack in detail. You could really just analyze this with all of your standard sophomore circuit theory, 
but you get something that's awfully complicated. So we'll make some simplifying moves to try to get some intuition. So I'm going to define an input here and an output over here. We'll worry about the output impedance of what's driving it a little bit later. I'm going to assume that whatever external load it's driving has some sort of input impedance that's sufficiently high that we don't need to worry about it. In the case of the Fender Baseman, it's driving a long-tailed pair. The resistor in this 56K spot is sometimes called the slope resistor. And one thing to remember about the capacitors is that if you don't see a unit listed, generally it's assumed that the unit is microfarad. So I have two 20 nanofarad capacitors and a 250 picofarad capacitor. In general, people think of this as the treble cap, the base cap, and the mid-range cap. Although, as you'll see in a second, everything in this circuit interacts. Nothing is buffered. So the three pots that are actually presented to the musician are the treble control, the bass control, and this middle control. So the treble control and the middle control here are both set up as potentiometers. The base pot, on the other hand, has the potentiometer just wired as a variable resistor, so it might be something like that. Now, there's another variation of the circuit where instead of the wiper going to the capacitor here, the capacitor is hooked to the top of the middle pot, and then the wiper is actually hooked something like this. Anyway, it's hooked up as a variable resistor. And in that variation, sometimes this won't be a pot. They'll just make this a fixed resistor. So you only have two knobs, a base control and a treble control. So if we want to accurately model this, we have to confront the fact that this is a third order system where all of the components interact. David Ye has a great paper on this where he apparently slogged through all of the math. Now, the naming scheme he used is slightly different than the one that I used, but it's not hard to translate between them. And if you take a look down here, you'll see that he figured out, okay, well, we're going to have a third order system. So here's the coefficients in the numerator and the coefficients in the denominator. And let's take a look at the formulas. <laughs> All right. So for the numerator, we have this expression, this expression, <laughs> and this expression. And for the denominator coefficients, we have these expressions. And then it's left as an exercise for the reader to figure out where the poles and zeros actually are. Anyway, you can see that everything here affects everything else. So this is not like a George Massenburg Labs parametric equalizer, where each of the equalization stages is independent. This is more like a Poltec EQ, where all of the controls interact, because although there are tubes inside of it, those tubes are just providing a gain makeup stage after the equalization, but the filter itself is all entirely passive components, inductors, capacitors, and resistors. So let's talk about what the input impedance of this kind of tone stack might be. Of course, the actual impedance is this horrendously complicated expression that is going to have third order terms in it. Let's suppose for a second that we want to look at particularly high frequencies. So what we can do is we can just short out all of these capacitors to be able to reduce this to just a resistance to get a feel for how it will interact with the preceding part of the amplifier. If I short out these caps, this base pot is completely bypassed. And I basically have this 56K slope resistor and the treble pot resistance in parallel. And that's in series with whatever the remaining resistance of the mid pot is. So let's look at the extreme cases. If that mid pot is turned all the way down on the schematic, and by down I mean this direction towards ground, then I just have these two resistances in parallel, which is around 46 kilo ohms. If, on the other hand, I have it turned all the way up, relative to how the schematic is drawn. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure if that's clockwise or counterclockwise. Then we have that full 25K in there. And if I add that to the calculation, I wind up with around 71 kilo ohm. So the resistance we have here depends on the settings of the knobs. 
but this gives us a general ballpark feel for what the resistance here is. The main thing to note is that it's on the order of the output impedance of the common cathode stages that we've looked at. And that's why a lot of amps will use a cathode follower in order to have a low output impedance, usually something around 500 ohms, so we can drive this tone stack without losing significant signal. So this is another version of the basement amp, but it's very different than the one we've been looking at. You can immediately tell that this is a later version by the fact that it uses a solid state rectifier instead of a tube rectifier, and it's just overall more complicated. Notice that it has two input channels, but each input channel now has an entirely separate tone stack. The interesting thing here, though, is that these tone stacks are driven directly from the outputs of common cathode stages. They don't have one of these cathode follower buffer things going on, so there is going to be some loss associated with that, maybe up to half of the signal. But notice that there is a second stage of amplification before you hit a third stage of amplification. So we have three common cathode amplification stages before hitting the phase splitter, unlike the earlier version of the amp where we only had two common cathode stages before hitting the phase splitter. Now, the normal and base inputs do differ, as you might expect. They have different tone stacks. So the normal tone stack compared to the ones we looked at before is a little different because there are only base and trouble controls. And this resistor down here is now just a fixed resistor instead of a potentiometer. On the base channel, we don't have a resistance down here by ground, but we do have a deep switch that lets you switch in some additional capacitance. Now the normal channel volume control has a trouble bleed cap that you can optionally switch in with this bright switch that's not present on the base side. On the Mesa Boogie dual rectifier, the tone stack comes after not one, not two, not three, but four common cathode preamp stages, including this crazy cold clipper stage, and it's buffered by a DC coupled cathode follower. And you have the choice of two different tone stacks that you can switch between, one for what's called the red channel and another for what's called the orange channel. While I was poking around on my hard drive and ran across a schematic for an amplifier called 100 Watt HRM, this is from ampgarage.com, and this is apparently based on a Dumble amplifier. Now, Dumble didn't publish schematics, and in particular, Alexander Dumble customized each amp to the player, so it's not like there's exactly one Dumble design, but people have done some reverse engineering on a variety of Dumbles and figured out some things. So this is a version, I guess, by MD Roberts 1243. So thank you, MD Roberts 1243, for your interesting work. And the HRM here stands for either Hot Rod Marshall or Hot Rubber Monkey. I'm not sure. There seems to be some controversy. Anyway, if you have definitive knowledge about what HRM stands for, please comment below. And the main thing that gives a Dumble Style amp its HRM qualities is the fact that there's a second tone stack. There's an initial tone stack that comes after the first preamp stage, and then there's some more preamp stages, and then there's a tone stack after the last preamp stage. And it's not like in the Mesa Boogie where there's two tone stacks in parallel and you choose one. You can switch these in and out in different ways, but you can actually use both of them in the circuit at the same time. This amp has all kind of switching features that you can control with foot switches. And here in the first tone stack, there's actually a rock jazz switch, which apparently switches various tone shaping components in and out. In order to figure out what's going on here, I would have to redraw this quite a lot with various switch settings to get an understanding of what's actually going on. Now, as far as the second tone stack goes, it looks a little bit more normal. One thing that's interesting about this design is that it looks like both tone stacks are driven by common cathode stages. I don't actually see any cathode followers in here. Oh, 
This is an interesting aside, not related to tone stacks, but looking at the long-tailed pair here. Notice that there's a potentiometer that's connecting to the load resistances. So we do have imbalanced load resistors to begin with, 91K and 110K, but it looks like there's this facility to trim that out further and either get more balance, or I guess if you want less balance, who knows? And while Googling around just now, I discovered there is a guitar pedal called the Hot Rubber Monkey. So I don't know if that's because Alexander Dumble actually thought HRM stood for Hot Rubber Monkey, or if people thought that and then they named this pedal accordingly. So if you know, let me know. 